We'd like to welcome you to the Christ the Savior Parish Tagaytay Philippines a School of Christian Studies and we're going to be studying the longer catechism of St. Philaret of Moscow and just to give you an introduction uh, actually that's the first part that we have here the introduction and uh, after that are three major parts and there's an easy way to remember what the parts are they are uh, after the introduction again the first part is on faith the second part is on hope and the third part is on love let's see here's a, a third part here on love so the first second and third parts faith hope and love and inside of each of those uh, are certain uh, parts that uh, we will study, including the uh, introduction. But <clears throat> let's just look for a second. The introduction has to do with divine revelation, holy tradition, holy scripture, and especially uh, focused on holy scripture. So we'll look at that first. But then the major parts, the first one on faith, has to do with the creed. And the creed has 12 different articles that uh, we'll be looking at. And also uh, studying about baptism, uh, communion, uh, penitence, and the sacraments of the church of Christianity of course we know there's many more sacraments than just the ones that we're listed so the second part down here at the bottom is the uh, second major part on hope and uh, it will get will get a definition of Christian hope and uh, details about it Lord's Prayer will be included in that and the different petitions in the Lord's Prayer uh, the doxology the Beatitudes uh, will study and then the last part the last major part is on love so remember faith hope and love and in the section for love uh, we'll be looking at the union between faith and love on the law of God and the commandments. So this area we take a look at the Ten Commandments. And then there's a conclusion, the application of the doctrine of faith and piety. So this is a picture of what we'll be doing. There's St. Philaret, and we want to thank him especially for doing this laying out this uh, really it's a hundred and thirty eight pages so we want to thank him for uh, going through all of this so that we might have a simple way to understand the Christian faith so we come now to the introduction of Orthodox Catechism the preliminary instruction before the major areas of faith hope and love so here we have question number one we want to understand exactly what is catechism the orthodox catechism it's an instruction so this is the answer in the orthodox christian faith actually that's what true christianity is and it's to be taught to every Christian to enable them for two areas especially number one is to please God and number two is for the salvation of our own souls so if we stop to think what is the meaning of this what's the mean real meaning what's the practical common sense uh, understanding of to please God well many times of course we want to please God and, and it's a concept in our mind but 
Let's take, for example, something that we're all familiar with in relationships. When we have a very important relationship to us, a, a, a friend that is maybe we our hearts are just joined together or it could be someone uh, that you love someone in marriage all of these with all of these relationships there's really one desire that a person should have and that is to please the other one to please them, want to do whatever is necessary to make them happy. And so in order to please God, it's interesting that we've got to take the emphasis off of pleasing ourselves to pleasing God, rather than being introverted, being extroverted, rather than being selfish, being loving and giving. So this is a big job that the Lord has to take care of inside of us that he can reorient us to pleasing God, pleasing the highest being, the personal, the father of all who made everything but this father so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that we might not perish but have life everlasting he so loved us so we need to be reoriented away from self and being able to please God so that's number one in question number one to please God and to save our souls. This is talking about salvation. This is talking about century after century throughout history. People have cried out, when will we have, when will a savior come? When will a deliverer come? When will someone called the Messiah come and help us and lift us up out of this kind of life that is filled with pain and sorrow and sickness and all of these things. This is God's big plan for salvation, to lift us up out of it. So when it says, and to save our own souls, we understand this is the mission that Jesus came. It says in the book of St. Matthew, and his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. And you know, it's interesting that the name of Jesus, why does it say in the first chapter of Matthew, and like a, a big announcement, a trumpet blowing, and his name shall be called, you know, back in the Old Testament, they cried out, send us someone, send us a deliverer, a Messiah, what is his name? And what is his son's name? And this was a, a, a cry that over hundreds and hundreds of years until in the fullness of time, God sent his son to save us. And first of all, we have to remember, so you see question number one is, has a lot more than just a very simple answer. First of all, we have to remember that God wants to do the work in us. We always want to do the work in someone else. We want to correct them. We want to make sure that they're going on the right path and, or we want to criticize them. We want to judge them. So this is turning around that. First of all, as Saint Seraphim of Serov said, first look inside and the Sermon on the Mount says first look at your own heart in your own eye in your own soul and if you do that and you can find peace in God then thousands around you will be saved how amazing is that alright we better go on to question two 
what we'll do uh, this first time, and this is just kind of an experiment, is we'll just do this first page of question one through six. Hopefully, God willing, help us, Lord, we pray. What is the meaning of the word catechism? Very interesting because this style of teaching, it tells us what it's about. It's a Greek word signifying instruction, here we go, or oral teaching and has been used ever since the apostles' times to denote that primary instruction in the faith, the correct faith, which is needful for uh, every Christian. Actually, it might be an ancient form of teaching, question and answer, question and answer, an ancient form of, of study together, of making sure that those that are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ have not just a mental understanding, but a, the basics, and they understand what it is that they're doing. So this word catechism is the primary way of instruction uh, for the Christian faith. And as it says, is needful for every Christian. And that's why we're doing this class. We'd like to make a whole complete package where uh, those that are coming to the church, those who are interested, uh, can online or download uh, the Christian faith catechism. So that's the meaning of the word catechism. All right, question three. What is necessary in order to please God and to save one's own soul? Okay, we're back to uh, what question number one said. The two areas, please God and to save one's soul. So the answer, in the first place, here we go, a knowledge of, let me just see if I can switch this down. There we go. In the first place, a knowledge of the true faith. What it means when it says true is we all want the correct faith. We all want the faith that is true. <laughs> we don't want someone's opinion. We don't want someone's commentary. We want some way, somehow, to get the true faith. And so that, that's a desire that's in our hearts, a desire that should be in your heart, a desire, a hunger almost, to want the true, correct faith to follow and to live by. We, we all want to know how do things really work? How, do, how does life really work? How are we supposed to be doing it? We, we probably know how we are not supposed to be doing it, but now we want to learn the correct way, the true way. And so a knowledge of this and a right faith in the Lord. Also, you know, to have a right faith, many times, many of us have had a different kind of faith. We've been taught uh, by uh, various uh, people that have thought they knew the right way, have kind of even made up uh, uh, their own doctrines and their own uh, uh, ways and truths and teachings and written so many books about it but, but how do we know that it's the right it's the correct faith so many times we've tried these other ways that people have taught and we've come up empty we we thought oh uh, we thought about where are the answers to prayer that Jesus said you will do these works and even greater works and we all wondered well we can't even do the works so maybe one thing we have to consider is that if we can find the true faith the correct faith and pray the correct way 
in a, a true way that God will honor that. The correct formulas, the way that things work. So what's next in question number three? After a right faith in him. In the second place, a life according to faith itself. Okay, so here we see again in question three, two areas. An area which is called knowledge and an area which is called faith. In the area of knowledge, it's like practical, tangible, uh, uh, visible ways that, uh, and things that are, exist. And that's the world of knowledge. That's the world of matter. That's the world of the visible. But now we come to the second part here. And the second part of question number three, a life according to faith. And so pretty soon we'll find out in the next question a little bit more about faith. But we've got to understand faith is something beyond our own five senses. Faith is something that is higher, something that will, something that is invisible as compared to the visible world of knowledge and matter and tangibleness. This world is invisible and we've got to understand that this world I don't I don't know exactly how to say it has primary is higher than the world of matter and knowledge and tangibleness this world of faith this is the world where the unseen is is reality just like we use our cell phones our Wi-Fi our tablets, computers, uh, TVs even, all of these things, Wi-Fi's in the air, it's invisible, TV signals, it's in the air, radio signals, it's all in the air, but it's still nonetheless real, real, real. It is, becomes tangible through a process. And it's the same way when you're uh, an architect, for example, is building a building or someone maybe an automobile they're designing a high performance engine motor but there's all of these in the invisible world it begins in the world of ideas and concepts and and uh, uh, imaginations all of these things which are invisible then begin to get translated to the visible world. What's next, would you imagine, if you were building a building? There might be a sketch of it. So you draw a sketch. From the sketch, it gets transferred to a drawing. From the drawing, it gets transferred to a blueprint. From a blueprint, it gets transferred to ordering construction materials. From construction materials, it gets organized into certain foundations and walls and plumbing and electrical all of everything is translated from the unseen from the idea world of ideas and concepts and diagrams in your mind to tangible a world of matter it it's transformed so there's a world of faith we've got to as it says here, have a life according to faith. We've got to understand how these things work. Now faith is not just, and what we've just said proves it, it's not just ideas, it's not just thinking, it's not just beliefs, it's actually taking those ideas, that thinking, those beliefs, and trans forming them into what? Faith without works, faith without actions is dead. That we must take our beliefs, 
our understandings, our ideas, and translate them into action and do them. So this shows us that the world of faith, the invisible world of the Holy Spirit, must be, cannot stay just simply in the unseen world, but it is meant to be transferred and transformed into the outer, tangible world in which we put them into action and actually do them. Wow, that's amazing, that's exciting. All right. Question number four, why, why is faith necessary in the first place? Answer, because as the word of God testifies, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God has a plan that from the life of faith, we can actually, we can actually be transformed, uh, transfigured, trans uh, mutated whatever the word you want to use we can be and this is a key word that we all want we all can be changed back into the likeness and image of God this is the whole process from faith to life from faith to life from faith to actually doing it. How exciting again. All right, let's move on. Question number five. Why must a life according to faith and good works be inseparable from this faith? So I think maybe we've answered this. Let's read the answer first. Because as the word of God testifies, faith without works is dead. So, we've answered the question, why must a life according to faith and good works be inseparable from this faith? Because, as it says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the wise man built his house upon the rock, and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. What does that mean? What does it say immediately before that? It says, these are those who not only heard the word of God, who not only listened to Jesus' teachings, who not only believed them in their mind and in their, their thinking, but these, the ones who built their house upon the rock, both heard and did what was instructed to them. So this connection must take place between understanding, believing, thinking, this unseen, invisible world must be connected and be the process by which we on the outside world inside outside and inside of our lives that we can live this life that we can be changed to be more like the Lord last question for today and that is what is faith according to the scriptures according to the definition of Saint Paul which is so beautiful Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 faith is the substance here it is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen that is a trust in the unseen as though it were seen in that which is hoped and waited for as if it were present Wow. Faith is the substance. See, there's the, we should have used that word before, the material world, the tangible world, the substance, the actual, here it is in real life. That's what faith is connected 
to the real, the substance of things that are hoped for and the evidence. Here it is, fact number one, fact number two. Here's the evidence laid out on the table. You can see it for yourself. You can touch it for yourself. The evidence in the courtroom of life of things not seen. Now what does that remind you of? Who was a character in the Bible? Who is called the father of faith? And why was he called that? Do you remember? It was Abraham. Abraham, it says in the scriptures, by faith called the things that were not as though they were. Can you imagine? He called the things that didn't exist, the things that were invisible as though they were visible, tangible, a substance, actual evidence. He called them as though they were. Abraham, amazing. Let us be more like him. So this is example of how faith and works. You could almost even say how faith and life, doing it, not just talking. And as they used to say, don't just talk the talk. You've got to not only talk the talk, but walk the talk. And so we'll conclude today here in this question number six and look forward to next time to continuing on checking out the basics of catechism for true Christianity. God bless you all and we look forward to see you next time.